Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we perceive relationships in animations. Let's start with a video. Now, in this video, even though the only characters are simple geometric shapes, we can still tell stories about what's going on. For example, the large triangle appears to be attacking or even bullying the small triangle. And the small circle appears to be hiding behind the door because it's scared about the fight. When Heider and Simmel first conducted this study in 1944, they found that observers almost universally described these cartoons and the characters in these animations as personified. They treated these characters as if they were rational agents. They treated them as if they had intentions, goals, character traits, and feelings. We wanted to test how this would change as the number of objects in one of these cartoons increased. So there's one major methodological challenge when analyzing what happens across animations, and that's how to create such animations. In animations, since the study by Heider and Simmel, studies of perceptual animacy have primarily relied upon scripted animations. Essentially, the videos are defined by an investigator storyboard. However, this may present a tremendous confounding variable when analyzing across animations, because the investigator storyboard may become a more important factor than any other experimental variable. In order to prevent this from becoming a major confound, we use algorithmically generated videos. The first two and a half weeks of my project dealt with programming an animation generator that would allow these in studies of perceptual animacy. The animation generator is a versatile computer application that allows investigators of perceptual animacy to define the numbers of objects, the types of objects, and the behaviors of objects uh, in order to create various animations. For example, in this one, the green squares are chasing the blue triangle and the red circles are attempting to collect around a point near the middle of the screen. The application of this animation generator are not limited to just these. For example, other behaviors are also modeled. Two objects may attract one another, they may repulse one another, or they can even be dead in the sense that they have no self-propulsion. In addition, in order to universalize this across studies of perceptual animacy, we add additional functionality. For example, user, uh, user interaction may also be defined. And in addition, it was programmed in MATLAB with a psychophysics to a buck extension because this allows versatility in including eye tracking in experiments to analyze where people's attention is focused. So our hypothesis is testing what happens as the number of objects in these animations increases. For example, in videos of three objects, even if you didn't tell the same story as me, for example, in the Hyder and Simmel cartoon, it is likely that you were able to recognize the story I was telling about the animation. However, as the number of objects increases to five, seven, or even nine objects, we may no longer able to be able to do this for a very simple reason. Our attention may be guided to different subsets of the objects. For example, I may be paying attention to two objects on the right side of the screen, while you might be paying attention to an object in the bottom left-hand corner. If we describe different objects, we may no longer be able to recognize the stories we tell about these animations. In order to test this, we, conducted, we created an experiment in two steps. In part A of the experiment, we created 14 videos in seven pairs. Each pair of video contained a specific number of objects and a specific number of characters. And these characters were defined by the same shape and the same color. But, there were, but each video pair was modeled by different behaviors in order to create two different animations with the same set of characters. In part A of the experiment, we posted the 14 videos on Amazon Mechanical Turk, an online platform where subjects may complete scientific surveys in exchange for payment. The subjects were asked to view all 14 videos and describe stories about what they saw in each video. In part B of the experiment, we wanted to test what people would say, uh, whether, pe a whether a separate set of observers would recognize that these descriptions related back to the videos. Now I'm going to show a video with three objects. While this does model the Hyder Simmel study in the sense that there are only three objects, there's a very big difference in the sense that the video is not scripted. You can still tell specific behaviors, though. For example, the green square is chasing the cyan circle, and the purple triangle is attempting to move to the bottom left hand corner. The way of Contextualize these behaviors in their stories, however, is very different. For example, one observer described this. The green square instantly fell in love with a cyan circle and followed it around everywhere it went. <laughs> Triangle was an introvert who didn't want to date anyone. <laughs> While this was one description, another observer described it completely differently. He, said, he or she said, the green square rear-ended the cyan circle and went into a fit of road rage and chased it around the city. So while people are still describing the same behaviors, they uh, describe stories in very different ways. Now I'm going to show the paired video of three objects. While this is modeled by the same characters, you can see that there are different behaviors. In this case, the purple triangle and the circle are attracting one another. 
once again, people contextualize this relationship in a very different way. For example, one observer described it as, Cyan Circle was looking for a fight and found one in the purple triangle. They hit each other until they could no longer move. On the following slide, I'm going to show a video with nine objects. I want you to take a couple of moments and try and describe a story to yourself about what's happening in the video. The story you're thinking of is probably very different from the story the person next to you is thinking of for a very simple reason. Your attention is guided to different objects and different relationships. One person might be paying attention to the tan circle and the green circle on the right side of the screen. Might be paying attention to the blue square in the middle and describe a characteristic relationship of other objects bullying it. So, for example, one observer described this as it was coffee break at work, and the green circle and the tan circle wanted to get away from everyone. So they went and they found their own room and they started kissing. <laughs> so, even with such simple an animations, people still describe stories about what's going on. Now, for the part B of the experiment, we wanted to test whether or not people would be able to recognize these descriptions. So we showed each observer one video of each set size, one video in each pair. And we either paired this video with a description of that same video, or the correct description, or a description of the other video of the same set size, which was modeled by the same characters, but was an incorrect description. We then asked participants to rate how well, or how poorly, the description represented the video on a scale of one to five. We plotted these results and analyzed them using a receiver operating characteristic curve. On the x-axis, we plot the false positive rate, which is essentially when observers are shown an incorrectly paired description, but still think it's a good representation of the video. On the y-axis, we plot the true positive rate, when observers are shown a correctly paired description and think it's a good representation of the video. Results such as the one shown here with six objects that fall along the main diagonal show that observers are no better than random chance at distinguishing between the two videos. Essentially, they think the incorrectly paired descriptions are just as good representations as the correctly paired descriptions. What we want is results that fall in the top left-hand corner, because that means people are able to distinguish between the two videos. This is exactly what we see with objects. The results fall in the top left-hand corner, meaning people differentiate the two videos. This is for two reasons. We postulate for two reasons. The first reason is because descriptions of these videos generally tend to relate to all three objects. So people have descriptions of what's going on in the context of the entire situation. And the second reason is because observers, when watching the video in order to compare it to the description, can also observe all of the objects and are thus able to compare the descriptions to what they saw. However, we don't see this trend when the number of objects increases. So the only video, the only uh, set of videos people can distinguish between the two videos is when there are three objects. Although as the number of objects increases, there is no general decreasing trend, people are no longer able to distinguish between the two sets of descriptions as the number of objects increases. Very important. Additionally, the reason why we postulate there is no decreasing trend is because of a confounding variable. For example, in specific videos of nine objects, a, green square tend, oh, sorry, a gray square tended to stand out to observers because it was moving slower than all the other objects in the video. As a result, people's attention tended to be guided towards this object. And people consistently described it in stories and were be better able to recognize the videos with nine objects. In order to prevent this from becoming a confounding factor in future studies, we propose a de design improvement. Rather than just having pairs of videos, we propose to include more videos for each set size in order to prevent this from becoming a major factor. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, shapes are great, but why do we care about circles, triangles, and squares bouncing around a screen? And the real reason is because it models human interaction. And this is especially important in security protocol. For example, many forms of security, such as event security and airport security, predominantly rely upon, rely upon security officials scanning crowds for suspicious behavior. This can be modeled using the animation generator. For example, animations with 20 red squares exhibiting one behavior and a 21st red square exhibiting a different behavior may be created. And observers may be asked how to detect uh, whether there's any difference in the animations, or we can study how they detect the anomalies in the animations. Eventually, this research can be applied to detecting threats and uh, improving security protocol. Even um, furthermore, this can eventually be applied to creating computer vision algorithms in order to detect threats. But this is a very long-run application of the project. 
Thank you, and I would like to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Jeremy Wolf, for introducing me to the field of cognitive science and allowing me to work in his lab. I would like to acknowledge Ms. Farnaz Wick for working very closely with me on experimental design and programming in this project, Ms. Uh, Bershana Oskin, Alec Lyon, Dr. Jenny Sendova for helping me with the paper writing process and the presentation process, CEE, RSI, and MIT for providing me this wonderful opportunity, as well as all of my sponsors. Thank you. So there are two questions. The first question is how many participants we tested. With part A of the experiment, we just wanted to generate responses to feed into part B. So we only selected 10 observers to watch the videos and provide descriptions. Data from one participant was not included because he provided the same response for several of the animations. For the second part of the experiment, we only tested 40 observers because we didn't see a conclusive trend and we wanted to modify the experimental design before continuing with further participants. The second question was whether or not we can model how changes in the number of types of objects essentially change the perception of group dynamics or individual dynamics. And before conducting the study that I described here, we conducted two earlier studies. So the first study was a pilot study, where we wanted to see how people would respond to algorithmically generated animations, whether or not they would still describe stories in relation to what was going on. So we tested a variety of different factors, such as how things would change as the number of types of objects change, as the behaviors changed. With part two of the experiment, we tested what you were describing, how people perceive group relationships. And what we did is we changed this across a number of objects. So we had three groups of objects, um, red circles, blue triangles, and green squares. And we vary the number of objects in each of these categories from 3 to 48. What we noticed is that there wasn't a general decreasing trend in the way people describe the stories as animate or if they described it in a literal way. For example, with three objects, what happened was people described individual characters and what was going on with individual characters. When you had 12 to 24 objects, people were no longer able to perceive individual dynamics or group dynamics because there were a few objects in each group and few, uh, too many individual objects to perceive individual relationships. However, when we added up to 48 objects, people perceived the relationships as more animate and more like they were human characters because they were able to dis distinguish different groups of objects and the behaviors that each of them were exhibiting. Does that answer your question? This seems like a kind of experiment where how you instruct your observers could change the results. So I'm just wondering exactly what you told the observers about the displays and what they should handle. Sure. How they should. So the question was, what did we tell the results? Now, we modified the experimental design about what we told observers through the three experiments that we conducted. And in none of the experiments were the observers told that they were supposed to, that, that we were studying animacy and how people perceive objects and how well represent, like what we were trying to, the hypothesis that we were trying to test. However, the way we asked the questions did change. In the first study, we wanted to see whether or not people, without prompting, would describe these animations as animate as if they were personified. So with the first set of, uh, with the first study, we asked people, describe the video, describe what so we did find a varying range, and a good uh, majority of them, 60% of them, were literal interpretations. But we still had 15 to 20% that were characterized as humans, and 30% that demonstrated intentional behaviors, as if they were trying to do something. With the second experiment and the third experiment, we were trying to test more so whether or not people could recognize the stories that people described. So we intentionally primed the viewers by asking them in the first part of the experiment, tell a story about what you saw in the animation. Questions and I will uh, separate them to make your life easier. <laughs> so you don't have to remember them. The first one, as far as I understand, you are trying to distinguish between the perception of multiple objects versus smaller, more or a large amount of versus smaller. Is there a simple conclusion like a two or three is good and uh, or five? I can or it depends on many other factors. Is there any simple rule? So the question is, is there any simple rule for how many objects we can observe and perceive individually? And what we found in our study with the 
data points that we had was you could only distinguish between objects when there were only three objects. So yes, there was that rule that we found, but we don't want to make this a generalization because we feel that the experimental design needs to be modified in order to test further. With experiments in cognitive psychology, we have to continuously modify the experimental design until we finally settle on one that truly tests the hypothesis that we have. And we found one major design flaw, which was that we only had pairs of videos instead of groups of videos, which presents a confounding variable. So yes, with three objects, uh, with three objects people can very well distinguish between videos. And after that, it tends to drop off. That's our hypothesis, which we want to test as, a number, um, as we increase the number of participants and as we change and modify the experimental design. But in general, we don't want to assert any specific rule as to how many objects people can observe. Well, just to show you, I've got three questions. I've got one more. Is there any uh, significance in the difference in behavior of nine versus eight? Eight is kind of more recognizable from the picture. So in the noise and all the three is different. So what you actually end up seeing is with, three, uh, with eight objects, you have this curve that falls below the main diagonal. And with nine objects, you have the second best curve, which falls all the way over here. So people are second best at recognizing nine objects. And the reason for that is the problem with our experimental design. We only had pairs of videos. So with the nine objects one, for example, uh, in this video, a lot of people described the green circle and the tan circle because they were different from all of the other objects in the sense that they were on the right side of the screen. So people were very easily able to identify videos with nine objects if people described it as, oh, these two went over to the right side of the screen and they were alone, because that makes it very easy to identify. With eight objects, there was no such description and there was no such object that attracted everybody's individual attention. So we hypothesized that as the number of objects increase, like from eight to nine, you'll perceive a lesser difference than from three to four, but that wasn't shown in the study that we conducted. Mm -hmm. How you envision using the results and findings, for example, for a security problem, for a recognition of the patterns of human behavior? How do you, do you use the framework for results? Can you make the link more explicit? Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we apply these results to improving security protocol? And the answer is, right now, based on the data we have, we can't do that yet. But the thing is, what, so the primary aim of my project was to design the animation generator that would allow us to conduct these studies throughout the future. And the animation generator is what can be applied to do this throughout the future. And the reason is very simple. It's because people perceive these objects as intentional agents as if they're like humans. So we can show observers videos with varying types of objects. For example, in two different studies that we propose to extend it. The first study we propose to extend is to increase the number of objects to perhaps 100 or 200, and model it with group dynamics. And then we can ask people to conduct certain tasks, so with user interaction, and see how people learn rules or how behaviors are governed with groups. Eventually, this can be extended to how people detect anomalies in these behaviors. So as I described earlier, you could have 20 red squares doing one thing and a 21st doing something different, and seeing what the differences are that people observe and how they perceive these differences. So eventually, and this is with a lot of future direction because this is a very novel field, the study of perceptual animacy. Not much research has been done in it. So eventually down the road, maybe in five or 10 years, we can even eventually study human footage with similar interactions and study how people perceive different relationships between individuals. All right, thanks very much. Ted. Thank you.